We're just getting people settled and we're gonna start in about 30 seconds. Oh, it's so good to be back in person. I know we were back in person last year, but we've got more people this year, so it feels good. <laughs> so welcome for those of you who I don't yet have the pleasure of knowing, but I will before the end of today. My name is Jennifer Coffey, and I have um, the esteemed honor of serving as ANJAC's current executive director. And I wanna welcome all of you to our 50th annual Environmental Congress. And um, as has been practice, can I get a motion to open the 50th Environmental Congress? Go. All right, all, all, do I have a second? second all right, all in favor? Wow. Excellent, welcome, welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Happy Friday the 13th. So that's that's a good luck day as I hear it. We are thrilled to have you here. We hope all of you are already following us on social media. For those of you who aren't, um, unlike me, you probably have your phones with you. I've lost mine, so we'll see what it shows up later today. Uh, these are the hashtags we're using on Instagram and um, Facebook. So if you follow us and, and check in throughout the day, let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you're learning. You'll see these hashtags throughout the day. We'd love to share the news with those of us who aren't able to be with us or haven't quite gotten here yet. I know traffic is the way that Jersey is this morning. So others will be joining us soon. I also want to offer a hearty thanks to our co-sponsors, our business co-sponsors, and our nonprofit co-sponsors. Many of them are here today with tables, and they are speaking because they want to share with you, and we want them to share with you the work that they're doing to better protect our environment, to fight climate change, to fight flooding, to help us with recycling and plastic reduction. So please do visit our vendors and tell them thanks for being here. They make it possible for us to offer this event at the cost that we're offering it and to continue to bring you good programming. So a hearty thank you to all of our business and nonprofit co-sponsors. And I wanna take just a few minutes, and I do mean a few minutes, so I'm gonna work on timing myself here, to talk about what we have done in 50 years. And by we, I don't mean Anjak, I mean all of you. And so about 50 years ago, give or, give or take a few years, this is a situation that we were looking at. And you know, this, this is not those May wildfires from Canada, because we all saw that for a day or two. This is what New York City looked like on the regular back in the 70s, in the summer. And we had waterways such as the Cuyahoga River that were spontaneously setting on fire because they were so heavily laden with chemical contaminants. We don't have that situation anymore. When I was a child, acid rain and ozone depletion and the hole in the ozone were the existential crisis. We have made enormous progress on those issues. And that is because of local advocates like you who have demanded change that went all the way up to the state level and made national change. What you do on the local level matters. When you say, we are filling in our wetlands too much, New Jersey listens. New Jersey had the first Wetlands Protection Act in the country in 1970. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court just recently rolled back wetlands protection. So we are going to have to double down and show them how you do it and go forward and make Jersey strong again so that the other states can follow us. New Jersey had the first chemical site contamination cleanup led by then law, led by then uh, Congressman Florio, who took the ingredients of New Jersey's law and lifted it up so that we now have a federal Superfund law. Where did contaminated site cleanup legislation start? New Jersey. Where did environmental justice law start? New Jersey. New Jersey, yeah, that deserves a big round of clap because that's a recent one. New Jersey has the first, and unfortunately, I believe the only at this moment, environmental justice law in the country. And who showed them how to do it? The Newark Environmental Commission by adopting a local ordinance, by working with advocates from the Ironbound Community Corps, by working with elected officials, and by 
advocating and by networking and by saying we need to correct the rights, the wrongs of the past. We need to make better decisions moving forward so that Governor Murphy and the legislature paid attention. And now New Jersey is a leader in environmental justice. New Jersey is a leader in cleaning up forever chemicals. We are the first state in the nation to have forever chemical legislation and regulations for drinking water. And the EPA is following and saying, yeah, Jersey, you've, you've got it right. And, and we're going to look and, and see if we can do even better. But Jersey, you're on the right track. Jersey is certainly on the right track with climate change. And that's because of all of you. You have done enormous work, enormous work on plastic pollution reduction with your 150 ordinances that you pass at the local level as environmental commissioners who would not leave their mayors and committee people alone and said, this is an issue where we need to take action because it's important for environmental justice. It's important for climate change. It's important for water quality. And so you took action to the point where Governor Murphy and the legislature could not not pay attention to you. So what you do at the local level matters. You have told us for years that flooding is getting worse. You knew this intuitively. You knew it because it's in your basement, because it's in your roadways, because it's in your businesses. And you said, we've got to do something. And I am thrilled beyond measure that New Jersey, as of July, now has the first set of regulations that use climate modeling to make land use decisions based on climate impacts. And that is because of you, because you talked about it and talked about it and talked about it and advocated and wouldn't stop that people like me and others could then work with the DEP, could work with the legislature and demand action. We're gonna have Sean LaTourette, our commissioner of DEP here this afternoon, and I'm sure he's gonna speak about that more. I'm particularly proud of this one because I worked on it for 15 years. So having that in place is gonna save lives. And I mean that 100%, making decisions based on climate impacts will save lives. And so I'm here to ask you for more because there's an awful lot of work to be done. We have done work on wetlands protection. We have done work on drinking water. We have done work on contaminated sites and on climate change, but we're not done yet and we need your help. So we are in a situation now where we are having a money crunch. You gotta follow the dollars, right? With, when you have dollars, you can get things done. So in 2014, you all stood with us across the state for a vote for a constitutional amendment. You helped us amend the Constitution of New Jersey so that we could dedicate funds for open space, farmland, and historic preservation, as well as hazardous site cleanup. So 10 years since you helped us amend the Constitution. And that funding happens by dedicating a portion of what's called the corporate business tax. And there is a proposal on the table that as of January, there will be a reduction in the overall corporate business tax. And we're standing up and saying, let's not give tax cuts to big businesses now to sacrifice funding for environmental programs. If this corporate business tax is cut, by two and a half percent, we will lose approximately $60 million a year annually to fund environmental programs, mostly open space preservation, farmland, historic, and hazardous site cleanup. $60 million a year annually to give big business a corporate tax break. And so we're standing up and saying no. And we're asking you as environmental commissioners to pass a resolution saying, don't do this. Don't cut funding to environmental programs. We're standing up and asking environmental commissioners to ask their township committees to do the same. And so there either is or will be momentarily a resolution of support on Ann Jack's action alert page. There are copies in our resource center and there's a whole session that's giving policy updates today. So we'll be talking about that more. So that's our action item for the day that we're gonna ask you to please consider. But we know you can do hard things because you have done hard things. And ANJAC is here to support you in doing more hard things as we, we look at creating a more just and equitable state, as we look at fighting climate change, 
as we look at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and becoming more resilient. ANJAC is here as your resource. We've got a mini resource center set up in room 123, so that's easy for you to remember, 123, and it's directly across from the lunchroom. So please come and visit us today. And with that, I wanna thank you and ask you again um, to please follow us on social media, uh, and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We've got lots of sessions there. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that all of the sessions happening in this room today are being recorded and select sessions in the classrooms are also being recorded. The microphones are very sensitive. So anything you say may be picked up and then posted online. <laughs> so being here at the Congress and hearing this announcement, um, we're taking um, as consent for, for being part of um, these sessions. The cameras will be mostly focused on the individual speaking, um, but if you do ask a question, we ask that you ask it at the microphone and know that um, you may be recorded. So. With that, I would like um, to now take the opportunity to introduce ANJAC's board chair, uh, Dr. Marion McClary, who is here to present our Environmental Achievement Awards to very well-deserving um, environmental commissioners. And so, Marion, I'm going to turn it over to you. As a quick aside, it is a pleasure to work with Marion. Marion, this is... This is a dream job, but Marion has my real dream job. So he's a marine biologist. And so the 10 year old in me is just a little bit jealous of what you do for a living. <laughs> but it's a great pleasure to work with you, Marion. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you. So, thank you, Marion. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jen. Um, so today, um, I'm gonna. I have the pleasure of, besides being uh, chair of the board of trustees and, and a marine biologist, uh, I'm, I'm at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, I have the pleasure of presenting the award winners. Um, so there's several categories of award winners and, and several winners within those categories. Um, when your name is called, um, you can stand and we can applaud. Uh, don't come up. We'll have time for pictures uh, later. But um, to keep it moving, just stay where you are, if you would, if you wouldn't mind, if you would mind. Thank you. Okay. So first, for the Environmental Commission Award um, Achievement Award, we have a bed minister for pond restoration. The next Environmental Commission Achievement Award goes to Caldwell for planting and for pollinators. <laughs> The next Environmental Achievement Award goes to Reddington for a new digital environmental resource inventory. The next Environmental Commission Achievement Award goes to Rumson for the Emerald Necklace Green Infrastructure Project. So now we get to the category of recurring uh, project awards. Um, this award goes to Pittman Environmental Commission for the BioBlitz 2023. <laughs> for the Nonprofit uh, Achievement Award goes to Kennedy's Garden and Friends Incorporated for patchwork for wildlife. Uh, for the Nonprofit Achievement Award, um, we have Mutual Boss for Food Waste Reduction and Distribution. Good. Next Nonprofit Achievement Award um, for Save the Environment of Morristown um, for Swede Run Field Restoration. The next nonprofit achievement award goes to um, Sustainable Rainwood Green Team for a Pollinator Garden. The 
the uh, Community Legacy Award goes to Richville Park Environmental Commission for the Richville Park Nature uh, Preserve. The next Community uh, Legacy Award goes to Seagirt Conservancy for Edgemere Park Pollinator Garden. Thank you so much. We know there are so many deserving environmental commissioners and we see you, we applaud you, and we are incredibly grateful for you. Uh, I uh, want to let the awardees know that we do have certificates for you and both Marion and I will be available throughout the day. Um, we've got a, um, a pretty background, which I've been informed is officially called a step and repeat. So a little red carpety for you. And that is in our resource center room. So you can come visit us in room one, two, three. So stop on by there and um, we'll get a photo and get your, your award throughout the day. And now, it is my incredible pleasure to introduce someone who is a colleague, a former environmental commissioner, uh, certainly someone who understands nonprofit staff and is an exceptional leader at the regional and federal level now, Ms. Olivia Glenn. So her official bio is in our program. So when you checked in, you got a one page agenda for the day, but there's a QR code on that. So use that QR code with your smartphone and you will find lots of information about the award winners, about our speakers today, a fuller description of the, the workshop sessions we're having. So check that out throughout the day, use that QR code and read more about Olivia in short. Olivia was appointed to EPA Region 2's Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for Equity in March of 2022. In these, role, uh, in these roles, Ms. Glenn helps oversee regional staff and guides EPA Region 2's efforts to embed environmental justice and diversity goals into all of its work. As I said, Olivia is a former Environmental Commission member, so she gets it. She uh, formerly worked for New Jersey Conservation Foundation, so she intimately understands land, and she is a former Deputy Commissioner for our DEP, so she really gets us. So Olivia, it is my great pleasure to invite you to the podium to have, um, you know, to tell us what you're working on and um, to share with us what we can be excited about. Thank you, Olivia. Let me get you set up here. It's for you. And then, thank you so much. I'm so, so thrilled. I'm so thrilled to see you. Good morning, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, as was shared, um, I'm the Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for Equity for uh, Region 2 of EPA. Um, and that region covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands and eight federally recognized uh, Indian nations. Um, and I love most about that, that New Jersey is within that region. Um, I am a Jersey girl. And uh, as Jen shared, uh, I used to be an environmental commissioner uh, in Pensacola Township, New Jersey, uh, which is down in Camden County. Uh, so, I, yes. <laughs> Now, I can't see really well too far. Is there anybody who's here from the Pensacola Environmental Commission? No? Okay, all right, very good. So um, they are a wonderful group of colleagues uh, who I was able to do so much work with um, and to, to really learn a lot. So um, I, I'll just start off. I'll start off by congratulating Anjek uh, for 50 years of service and 50 years of leadership. Um, yes. It's nice to be in a room with people who feel like clapping this early in the morning. So we'll, we'll keep that going, we'll keep that going. <laughs> so um, I guess in recognizing Anjek and the wonderful work you've done, it's not only the grant making, um, but it's all of you who make up the organization. And I know that for myself. 
um, and having worked on an environmental commission um, and having worked with Jen Coffee. How I met Jen um, was when I became um, an environmental commissioner in my town, pretty new. And I went to one of those introductory trainings for brand new um, environmental commissioners down in Camden County um, in a little obscure place. And Jen found her way to be there on a Saturday morning and uh, that's when I got to meet her. But that's just the kind of person she is. Um, it's not just the spotlight and sitting in front of legislature, members of the legislature, but it's also being in the trenches and investing in individuals who make up ANJEC. So in celebrating the 50th anniversary, Jim, we also celebrate you and your leadership and your team. <laughs> So yes, now going back to my Pensacola Environmental Commissioners. So um, I kind of said this to the staff at EPA when they were like talking me through, you know, what did I want to say today? Um, and really, I believe this, that uh, serving on an environmental commission shows you the true essence of public service and volunteerism. Um, I know the environmental commissioners that I've worked with and some of you who are here in this room today, people who serve on environmental commissions are truly invested in their community. They're truly volunteers. They really foster a sense of place. Uh, so those are some wonderful projects that were awarded today. Um, but there was a gentleman, Mr. Caballero, who I met um, online in the middle of the pandemic, uh, who works in the corporate sector, but talked about the wonderful work that he does on his environmental commission, on his green team, so many hats that he wears in his community. And um, I found that experience to be very much like that for me when I was an environmental commissioner. Uh, because by the time I had done that, I had already worked for the state of New Jersey, had six years, had come out as working in a nonprofit organization. And here I get to this little environmental commission meeting, and I'm like, wow, I thought I knew how government worked. I'm learning something every month um, and really learning, um, you know, that local government is really what drives what even becomes state priorities, you know, for all the permits that come to the New Jersey DEP and things that eventually become uh, come to the attention of EPA, they start in a community with someone's idea, with someone's thought about where can this place go? Where can it be sited? Uh, should we put some trees here? Should it go 50 feet in the other direction? Like all these considerations are things that start in the community, on the community level. So environmental commissioners, you're right there um, on that front line. And so those little things that you do for your respective town, think of the other 560 plus municipalities in New Jersey and how that collectively adds up to be really true impact. So thanks for all the hats you wear and for all the things you do. So my role right now uh, in working with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, I came to the agency uh, last year um, as part of the Biden administration, and I was working in New Jersey before that uh, as the deputy commissioner, uh, working on environmental justice and equity priorities uh, for the New Jersey DEP. And um, I have to say, it wasn't an easy decision. I actually wasn't looking for the opportunity to go anywhere. Um, it came to me. and um, it was, it was really a decision I had to think about because of that leadership that New Jersey has had in the space of environmental justice. But then once I was learning more about the platform uh, that President Biden had to further the work of environmental justice and equity, I'm like I can do the same work, but I'll be able to engage with more states and some territories and even some of our uh, federally recognized Indian nations. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna step up because it's not just about New Jersey, it's about just impact, having an opportunity to impact our nation. And so what does that look like in terms of actual bricks and mortar? These two acts here are the embodiment of it. One is the bipartisan infrastructure law and the other is the Inflation Reduction Act. And under both of these sources, um, both of these pieces of legislation, there are tremendous sources of funding that complement them, uh, that enable us to do great work in all of our communities, but also with a lens to further environmental justice and equity. So a part of that work and how we're trying to capture how well are we doing is Justice 40. And what we're looking to have is 40% of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act monies going to communities that have been designated as overburdened or disadvantaged. So we have some measures of that on a federal level, but working in New Jersey, it's wonderful because New Jersey has an environmental justice law. 
where that work of identifying overburdened communities has already been put into place. Um, and the same thing uh, with the state of New York, they have also identified what they call disadvantaged communities um, and have moved forward with advancing a law uh, that does still need to go through a rulemaking process, but they're making strides uh, in the right direction, really doing great work also. So it's really that meeting of the minds of the federal government with communities, with state governments and local governments uh, to have a whole of government approach uh, to move really good work and priority projects forward. So some of these pots of money uh, that are available as a subset of those two pieces of legislation, uh, one of them is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And there's $27 billion that's coming under the umbrella of the Inflation Reduction Act. And what this fund is going to do is leverage public investment with private capital to fund projects that will combat the climate crisis and also create good paying jobs. Now of that $27 billion, there's $6 billion that's being set aside for clean communities investment accelerators, which are community driven nonprofit pollution reduction initiatives. And if you want to learn um, more about that and any of the other uh, funding sources that I'm about to talk about, we have a website, it's called epa.gov slash inflation hyphen reduction hyphen act. So I'll say it again, I see some people writing. epa.gov slash inflation hyphen reduction hyphen act, where you can learn more. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Another wonderful program we have underway right now is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program. And so with that program, there's a $5 billion grant pool uh, that gives money out to local governments, states, territories, and tribal nations. And so the way we've started it right now, what's in motion right now are planning grants. With the planning grants, every state that's put in paperwork was eligible to get $3 million in planning money. And I'll tell you, New Jersey was one of the first states in the nation to get their paperwork in to say they wanted to be a part of this planning process. And so that planning process is going to take place until early next year, like the first fit, the first quarter of the calendar year next year. Uh, what was just recently announced by our administrator several weeks ago are climate pollution implementation grants. They're not going to be due until the spring. So we're going to get through the first quarter of next year where the planning is done. And then in that early, right after that, um, that's when the implementation grants will be due. So with the implementation grants, uh, we're looking to fund topics that were raised in plans that we will then support fiscally. So if you have ideas about implementation, and you can see here in the bullets some of the priority categories, make sure that you're checking on the DEP's website. And even uh, if you live in one of our metropolitan statistical areas, uh, that you make sure you're aligning with those because the states get $3 million each. The metropolitan statistical areas get $1 million each. So there's one for uh, the greater Philadelphia area, which pulls in Camden. You'll have to work with region three of EPA for that. I know it's our boxes, but nonetheless, I'm trying to tell you where the boxes are so you know where to go. Um, so the region three office is based in Philadelphia. So if you're in that Camden area, you fall in that metropolitan statistical area. Um, I'll give you my fellow chief of staff in region three. Her name is Terry with an I, Terry Dean. And she can help weave you in for what's happening uh, in the Camden area if you're down in that part of the state. Uh, for those of you who are in North Jersey in the New York Metropolitan Statistical Area, there's also $1 million available um, in that section of the state. Um, and so tap into those resources as well. Uh, if you go to our website, that website I shared with you, you keep digging, you'll find a link eventually that'll get you to CPRG and you'll know who you can connect with uh, who's advancing the planning in that section of the state. But you can make sure that as those plans are being developed, things that you think are implementation priorities are embedded in there. Uh, the document for the state of New Jersey, the one that's statewide, uh, they call it a SCAP. So SCAP stands for a State Climate Action Plan. So take a look at that, give some feedback on it now. So when it's time for implementation money, you're well positioned to know it's in the plan. We're, we're eligible to, to go ahead and look for the opportunity to get more funds. 
Okay, and so there is another program uh, that we're pouring a lot of money into. It's called SWIFR. Uh, for for short, you know, government, we have our acronyms. We're going to try to avoid doing that, but I like that one so much. Um, but it stands for Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling. And what it's really trying to do is propel really good ideas to further recycling in our communities. So in 2022, the bipartisan infrastructure law granted EPA $275 million to create the grant program. And SWIFR has allocated $55 million in grants every year since 2022 all the way through 2026 uh, following a national recycling strategy. If you haven't seen that, that's something that's worth looking into. Um, and it's looking at weaknesses in the American recycling system for reinforcement. Now, I'm going to go back to my environmental commission days in Pensalkin Township. And I um, lived in Pensalkin about 20 years, you know, childhood, you know before I served on a commission and I thought I knew something about recycling. So I sat in that room with my environmental commissioners and really understood how it worked behind the scenes. So I know that I'm talking to a group of people who know something about recycling, especially in your town and how it can be made better. So uh, I would say certainly uh, look into these resources, feel free to share them uh, with your local elected officials, uh, just so you know what opportunities um, are available to you. So for the state revolving fund, uh, this is a lot of money that really falls under the umbrella of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I know that Commissioner LaTourette is going to be here uh, later today, and he can talk to you about uh, how this is rolling out on a state level with real great uh, specificity. Um, because we take this money and uh, we've given it to our state governments to, to move that money forward and advance projects. So uh, for the uh, state revolving fund, it falls under two big buckets. Buckets. One is clean water state revolving fund money, and the other is drinking water state revolving fund money. And you can see uh, that uh, in 2023, we had $124.5 million available for uh, the state revolving fund clean water side. And then uh, $142 million available for, this is one many two acronyms for me, I don't even know what that one means, CSRFDW. I'm not even sure what that means, so we're going to leave that alone at the moment, but I'll follow up and make sure I find out what that acronym in particular means. But in total, for 2022 and 2023, uh, the state revolving fund has received $495 million. So lots of opportunity uh, for really great work. Um, and I'll mention one other thing that New Jersey should be really proud of. New Jersey was only one of four or five states who was selected um, by our president and vice president to be a part of a lead service line replacement accelerator program. And yes, something to be very proud of. So uh, with that program, uh, because of the great work that New Jersey has already been doing, um, being the pilot to advance some of this work, um, we're really going to show the nation how it's done. To do that work of figuring out where are lead service lines, um, and then how do you go about the process of replacing them. Really great work is already done in Newark um, with that situation that happened a few years ago. We saw that whole of government approach and community coming together uh, to make that turnover really quickly. And so that is one really great example of how we can do great work together on an expedited timeline. Uh, we're looking forward to see uh, more opportunities like that being supported in our state. Uh, so I know, um, I imagine that Commissioner LaTourette will raise this because it's something he should be really proud of uh, in the work that, that he's done to, to share some more specifics. We just had the opportunity to give the money for the work to be done. And so with environmental justice, specifically in this administration, so the really good thing about, you know, the work that I'm doing right now, yes, there's a lens of work that is um, prescriptively environmental justice, but it also permeates everything that we do. And just bringing the lens and bringing that perspective to all the things that we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, within our agency. And um, the same kind of lens can also uh, certainly apply uh, for environmental commissions. I'll get to that in a moment. So uh, with environmental justice, um, much like the work of environmental commissions, um, it has been the local voice and communities who have always driven awareness and movement in this space. 
And so it had been in the 60s that there were communities talking about the disparities that they could see where landfills were sited and hazardous waste sites were located. And understanding that we probably needed to do a little bit better um, in the work that we do in our planning and our zoning and communities and determining where facilities go. And certainly with some of the impacts that come on communities that have those facilities, uh, the truck traffic that results from it. Um, sometimes these are facilities located in places where most of the residents don't even own a car. They get around on public transportation, bicycles and everything else, um, but they're surrounded by so much air pollution. And so uh, just some of those things are like real disparities that are in place um, that communities have raised for years. And so the federal government responded to that. Um, and in uh, 1994, with President Clinton, he issued our nation's first environmental justice nationwide executive order is 12898. And um, until several months ago, uh, that was the only environmental justice executive order that was ever issued by a president. So President Biden came around and issued a new one uh, earlier this year. Um, that has definitely um, updated it and given a bit more teeth to the work that we do and engages all of our federal agencies, gives us some clear benchmarks on the things that we do, uh, we can do to move this work forward together. So how can this filter down to environmental commissions? So I think about some of the projects uh, that would come up during my tenure as an environmental commissioner. After the, you know, the planning board has seen it, the zoning board has seen it, then it comes to the environmental commission to have their chance to take a look at it. And you know, really, as an environmental commissioner, you have the front row seat, one of the first seats to be able to look at something and say, does this make sense for everyone in my community? where do we need another type of this facility in our community? Does it need to be situated here? Is it close to a playground? Can we plant some trees um, to, to mitigate some of the um, uh, asphalt covering that may be there for a parking lot? Can we install any rain gardens? Can we add a trail along the border because there may be some access to a waterfront uh, that a community may not have if this facility is here, but maybe just put that in so the community can continue to enjoy um, their waterfront. Just small things you can think of to make sure that there isn't um, the loss of benefit to the community. So thinking of environmental justice, not only from the environmental stressors, more environmental stressors, but also thinking of it as providing more environmental benefits for the people who are in your community. So just some thoughts. Okay, so I can keep talking too um, about some of the other ways um, that environmental commissions can do some great work. Um, so I thank you for all it is that you do. Um, and just thinking about you know, how you uh, work going forward, I saw some really great projects that came up as awards and uh, some of them being pollinator gardens and pictures that had children in them being a part of it. Um, I think it would be really, really awesome to find ways for us to have more of our youth involved um, in the ongoing work of our environmental commissions, whether it's through those events that you have on the weekends or working with the ecology clubs that are in the high schools that are within your district of residence, um, just planting the seeds in their minds of you know, what the potential is uh, for how it is they can serve their community in the future. Um, because some people like me will decide that they wanna be an environmental professional, uh, but some like Mr. Caballero, for example, who works uh, in the private sector, you know, he works in the private sector, but in his home life, in his personal life, he does so much as a volunteer uh, in his community. And I know that's the case for many of you also. So thinking about how do we just build that chain of civic engagement um, from youth all the way up. And then when it's time to look for uh, replacement environmental commissioners, you know, you have a whole cadre of youth and young adults who know exactly what an environmental commissioner is um, because they've been a part of your efforts all along. So thank you for all of the wonderful work uh, that you've done. Um, if you have any questions about uh, what we're doing at EPA, I'm happy to, to be here to address any questions you have. So thank you. Thank you 
so much, Olivia. That was fantastic. So we do have time for Q&A. We would ask that folks go to the microphone. So we have one mic in this aisle and one mic in that aisle. If you um, have trouble moving to the microphone, just raise your hand and we'll bring you one. But we'd like to, to take a few minutes to see if you have any questions of our um, chief of staff for EPA Region 2, Olivia Glenn. No questions. She's answered all of the questions. Yes. <laughs> EC members aren't usually shy. No. I was going to say, because I've got questions. Olivia and I could sit down and work out some stuff for like the next hour. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we've got a couple of people at the mics. So, yes, we can hear you. Actually, you know what? I'm not. We can hear you, but I'm not sure if the mic is on. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Ah, how about that? Oh, that's even better. All right, let's. Just a let's simple you. button. <laughs> you would think a former TV broadcaster would know that too. Uh, Ms. Glenn, you gave a a beginning timeline for some of the money to be distributed uh, under uh, the legislation that was passed by Congress. Um, I also see, though, the potential, and I know you probably don't want to wade into politics, but next year is a presidential election year. Can the rollout continue uh, in EPA's estimation as the political wars heat up uh, toward next November? So I'm going to hold this mic so that Jen, don't go anywhere. You stay right there. They're going to, we're going to do this together. Okay. So Jen has a mic. I have a mic. Okay. So uh, yes, some of those funding opportunities have already rolled out. Um, some are like already in the hands of the state of New Jersey, uh, like with the bipartisan infrastructure law. And there are, I only gave like a sampling of some of the funding opportunities uh, that are already out um, and some more that are even to come. So many of those will be okay because when they were initially passed, they were passed with um, the, the carryover to be over the course of several years. So even when we thought there was a chance of a shutdown a few weeks ago, um, the work that we do under uh, some of our uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act projects would have been able to continue carrying forward because they're not tied up in this particular budget process. Now, there's no doubt that it can complicate some things. Uh, so, you know, you walk it out slowly, but it's not going to shut down everything. There's still the potential to, to keep going um, with, with most of these funds. That's well, a good news. A, a good point, though, about the shutdown uh, that potentially is coming November 17th, I think it is. Uh, how much could a one or two week shutdown impact the timetable? Uh, for staff to process uh, all of this money that's already in the pipeline. Well, I'll tell you that what we're doing right now is working very expeditiously um, because we all know uh, who all of us who are working in the federal government, we know right now that we're working until November 17th for sure. So we're making the most of the time we have. OK, and so we're going to keep those wheels moving um, because that's what we're there to do, public service. So we'll carry it forward. If anything um, happens to need to move with timelines, we'll be sure to get the word out. But um, at this point, we're just going to keep moving ahead, we're going to keep moving forward with all that we do have. Good luck. Thank right. You. Thank you. OK, I'm shorter than he is. <laughs> <laughs> I have faith in you. I had a question about SWIFR, you know, the floor map th act that you, <laughs> um, does it address composting? Because in New Jersey, we have a big issue with our composting, le current composting legislation and the ability to have composting programs that aren't just big commercial operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question that I do not know the answer to. So Michael, who's my EPA colleague, who's here with me, can you please make a note of that? And can you tell me your name, please? Kathleen Cacavalli from Madison. Okay. So we are going to follow up with you because I'm going to get an answer to your question. Thank you very much. And okay. we know we've Thank got you. Kathleen's information, so yes. we can we can connect you guys. Good morning. I have a question. Um, does the EPA have any really hard-hitting hitting literature on recycling? Um, not just to encourage people to recycle. I don't think that's really working, but maybe something hard hitting to almost, I don't know, I'm going to say scare them into recycling. 
um, and encourage people, maybe some other literature encourage people to limit their use of plastics. So I think that we have some really good literature that's out there. Um, what we could do is maybe have somebody in our L card program. Michael, he's taking notes. He stopped taking pictures to take notes. That's good. Um, so we'll 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 see what maybe we can provide you. So you know some of the the whole suite of resources that we do have. Okay. Um, and certainly, uh, once you have an opportunity to see more of what we do have, if you have ideas of how we can do it better, you know, feel free to share that with us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I will just add in on that, if you don't mind, um, that I, I do believe that New Jersey has the strongest Plastic Pollution Reduction Act in the country. Uh, and we followed that by the strongest uh, recycled content law in the country, actually the first recycled content law. So that requires that the plastic that you put in your recycle bin and you hope it goes to a better place that it does have to go to a better place because new plastic has to be made from old plastic. And we're thrilled that California said, hey, New Jersey's got a good idea and picked up our law and implemented it. And so when I was called by the press and said, hey, what do you think about California's new law? And I said, I think it's great they're following New Jersey's leadership on this. <laughs> <laughs> but California being the fifth largest economy in our world, um, really has, has got some buying power that New Jersey doesn't. So they're really going to shift the marketplace. In the new legislative session, we're going to be working on additional um, packaging reduction uh, bills, bottle bills. And so please stay around for the four o'clock hour when we have Senator Smith here. And so he can talk about that more and you can, you can nudge and cajole him and encourage him to take that up in the new session. And certainly we'll be working with Olivia and others at EPA to, you know, work on recycling and change the whole system really. Um, so let's go on this side. Hi, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Is this mic working? Mm -hmm. Yep. So one of the challenges that we have faced in our community is kind of the difference between what is mandated as far as recycling goes and what is actually recyclable. So, you know, for example, mandated is plastics one and two, and but what is widely uh, requested from our uh, recycling plants is like plastics number five, which is like so much of everything else. So like the kind of difference between our, D, our um, Department of Public Works and what they're hearing from our recycling, like Monmouth County Recycling, for example, and what we're trying to push out to our community to build awareness about plastics number five and other things like that. Like, you know, how do we bridge that gap between what's mandated and what is actually recyclable? Yeah, that I feel Olivia looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, that is a huge challenge. And part of the issue is that in New Jersey, um, recycling is done on a county by county basis in terms of what is allowed and what's not. And my own opinion is that we need to require more to be mandated. But I know that there are technical issues then with getting the counties up to the level where they actually can then recycle some of these materials. I'm going to out the real expert in the, the room here, which is uh, Gary Sonnemeyer, who's down here in the front, and encourage you all to um, not swarm him, but have conversations with him today about that. Um, I also want to get your name. If you can connect with some ANJAC staff, I know there are some in the room. There's there's Deanie right there waving. So um Let's let's talk about that in conjunction with some of the bills that we know we're going to be working on with Senator Smith in the in the new legislative session, because the goal is is ultimately to use less plastic because plastic is fossil fuels to help create a more reusable society to move us towards making old plastic out of new plastic when or. Yeah, making new plastic out of old plastic, strike that and reverse it, <laughs> uh, so that we've got a more sustainable system when that is possible and when it makes sense. Uh, but not all plastic is going to be recyclable, and we've got to we've got to change the manufacturing and the recycling and the production and all of it. So it's a it's a phased approach, and I think New Jersey is really ahead of the curve and has been a national leader in this. So let's chat. You'll connect with Deanie, and we'll we'll incorporate that into what we're doing in the new session. Thank you. And again, if there's anybody who needs a mic who's not able to get to the mic, raise your hand and keep it up and we'll get Anjak staff to bring you a microphone. My name's Alan. I'm from the East Windsor Environmental Commission. We're 12 minutes away from here. So I got here one, two, three. I'm having a big fight uh, with the 
uh, the leaf blowers, the gas operated leaf blowers. They're polluting the air in our development, they're county wise, and I've been fighting and it's a losing battle. We want to go to electrical or battery operated leaf blowers and the electrical apparently are half as efficient and it's very costly to switch. So we're gonna have an ordinance passed in our township, Princeton passed an ordinance banning them, but we, I'm fighting the cost in other words, Shearson is one of the companies that is using it. You should see the pollution. I mean, I watch how they, with the leaf lowers, we have 370 families and then three, four times a week. This is just one county. County wise, the leaf blowers are all gas operated, terrible pollutants. So I wanna see how we could try to get them to switch over to electric and battery, which would cut down on the pollution. But it's a major problem for us. I don't know, is EPA working on leaf blowers? Not yet. <laughs> that one's on our radar yet. Um, well, we've got a new brochure on that with some advice. And so come check us out in our mini resource center, room 123, and we've got some literature for you. Um, we also have, uh, I don't know if Sheila's still in the room, Sheila baker Gajal, who's waving her hand, worked on Maplewood's ordinance. She's over there, so you can connect with her. And um, there's some astronomical statistic that I I... I'm hesitant to say, but I think I'll get it right enough that it's a two hour session, I believe it is, with a gas powered single stroke leaf blower is equivalent to driving an F-150 from Texas to Alaska. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the pollution is astronomical. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay. also 30 minutes. Okay, so I, I gave them way too much benefit of the doubt. Two stroke engines. Okay, thank you. So 30 minutes with a two stroke leaf blower. I knew somebody would correct me. Thank you. That's why I love having you all here as equivalent to a, a drive across the country. And uh, so it's it's certainly an environmental issue. Uh, it's a pollution issue. It's a noise issue. I have um, several friends who have children with different learning abilities and are on the autism spectrum. And the noise, I mean, the noise drives me insane. It's its a lot. So we can work on this. Um, that's why we put together resources and we've got staff who have worked on these. It takes an awful lot of education um, and there's a lot of pushback from landscapers. So thank you. And we've got some, yeah. Tell us if you're um, 10, 1135 slot in room 117. Um, and the Wichita Power Environmental Leaders can help you survive biodiversity. We're going to talk about 1145 in room 117 for more about leaf blowers and um, other issues. Okay. So uh, let's go to this side, Amy. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Jen. And hello, Olivia. Great to see you again. Um, I'm Amy Hansen, New Jersey Conservation Foundation. And I'm just wondering I know the EPA has been looking at uh, various uh, pesticides and um, I think we need more stringent rules and and some of these pesticides that are allowed to be used in, in America are not allowed elsewhere and they're good reasons. And particularly the uh, seeds that cor the corn and soybean seeds that are treated with neonicotinoids um, are just really harming pollinators as well as getting into our water and harming birds, et cetera. I'm just wondering, those fly under the radars, as I understand it. And I'm just wondering if you might talk to your talk to your folks back home and um, see if they could look into that. It's just really, really concerning for our pollinators and for our, our world. Yes. Yeah. I sure will. Thank you. So, thank you, it. Amy. Let's go over to this side. Hi, I'm Cassandra Sledge. I'm from Madison with the Mitchell Morris. Um, and okay, so all of these things are so multifaceted and each one of them deserves its light. One of the questions I had that came up um, when there was all this discussion about plastics, because right now I'm working in the arena of food waste um, and preparedness planning. However, um, one of the deep dives that I kind of found myself in was looking at how to reduce plastics. But right now, the recycling effort is so is put so heavily upon the consumer. And so in order to try to get to the root of the problem, like I would anything, if you have a dying plant, you know, you got to kind of check the leaves. Do you have little aphids? Do you have problems? Do you got to check the soil. You check the pot and you get down to the bottom and you're like, there's root rot. Oh, okay. You can fix it. So I kind of started doing this thing. So 
that you're here, um, because you're here, and I just wanted to use the opportunity to ask a question, what types of things are being done or how can we get better involved to slightly move the onus away from the consumer um, and look at from a manufacturing standpoint, because I know there's all of the legal and you're going to deal with a lot of things. Um, <laughs> um, but what sorts of things are we looking at already? How can we be a little bit more involved to move? So in, and also in an addition to because Mitchell Morris did the we're working with reducing food waste, but in even doing that, putting the food into the compost that this food has died already, you still have all the plastic left over and you have mounds and mounds of the plastic. So you kind of have to look at how can we reduce some of those things in addition to as the consumer, how do we encourage the recycling on the consumer side? These are all really incredible ideas. Um, I personally am, I have no brain trust in that space, <laughs> but I can tell you that I know a whole cadre of people at EPA who do. Um, and so we'll take your name too. I'll have them follow up with you. And I'm going to tell you something else we're going to do next year, because I already mentioned LCARD. Um, that's our uh, land and chemicals division um, that also does a lot of work in the recycling space. I'm going to make sure that they're here next year because I'm going to let them who are the brain trust of all that kind of great work be here to uh, engage with with all of you but we will also get you an answer in the short term thank so, you and you said you were from um the Morris Madison, mutual. mutual Morris mutual Morris mm -hmm. and what's your name again Cassandra Sledge Cassandra Sledge okay. thank you Thank you. Thank you. So, and Jack staff note, we've got a session for 2024 Environmental Congress in the works. Yes. Thank <laughs> you, Olivia. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. My name is Lois. I'm from Westfield Green Team. We don't have an EC, but we're working hard to get one. I just right. wanted to thank you for coming, Olivia, and to let everybody know we are starting with help from and Jack and Deanie a New Jersey Beyond Plastics chapter. It'll be the first one in the state, really focused on advocacy at the state level. So reducing plastics and we really need ECs on board. And I love that you talked about lead reduction in our water. Yes. We also need to reduce plastic, microplastics in our water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I want to say to the gentleman regarding our um, gas leaf blowers, is that Senator Smith has some legislation that he's put forward and there will be a hearing later in November. So we really need people to speak out if they are against it. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. Thanks. Thank you. And congratulations to you. Let's give her a round of applause for starting a new environmental commission. Hello. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction i'm I, i'm martin slane from mendham township environmental commission and um i guess all of us around here are, are trying to put in place new local ordinances and i was just wondering if there's anything already available in terms of templates or whether there's a way that you know we see suddenly a neighboring uh community has developed an ordinance it would be good if there was some sort of visibility. Maybe we could collate them in one place because we're all trying to develop these ordinances and work out how to frame them. We're, we're, we're putting in place, trying to get sign off for an ordinance on native planting. So any, any, uh, any community buildings would have to have only native plants in the landscaping. And we're trying to get that through. But, you know, we're learning from what we see from other from other communities and i wonder if there's a way of pulling together ordinances or templates or draft ordinances so that we can all see these examples and take some of the workload off and give us ideas as well absolutely i'll, I'll take that one um anjak is your resource and we have temple template ordinances sample ordinances best practice ordinances we are a half century plus old, so we're working on uh, developing a digital resource so that those ordinances, when you can't sleep at two o'clock in the morning, we want to be where you scroll so that you can check those out. But if you contact us and come visit us in the mini resource center, um, if you are looking for pretty much whatever kind of ordinance you need, we either have it or we can go get it or tell you it doesn't exist yet and help you make it. So um, yes, please come visit us in the resource center in room one, two, three. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Barry Draycott. I'm the owner of TechTerra Environmental. Um, we're, we supply minimum risk pesticides and organic-based fertilizers to landscapers. I just want to bring a couple things to your attention. We were talking about neonics earlier, and um, yeah, they've been a problem for a long time. Uh, we're lucky in New Jersey that they they have pretty much been banned for the use in the landscape, not agriculture, but in in the landscape. Um, a lot of landscapers are hooked on their pesticides and stuff, but uh, so there, there have to be other options for them. And uh, just so you're aware, um, there there are products that are are natural. Um, one of the things that can be used for grubs and and beetles that are you know killing a lot of plants and lawns, causing a lot of havoc. Um, it, it's basically a, it's a bacteria that only specifically kills grubs and adult beetles. Will not harm anything else. It's just as effective as the neonics. And just recently, the manufacturer that has reduced the cost. So it, it's pretty much equal to what the uh, neonics are. So I just wanted to put that out there. Great. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Let's go to this side. We've got a couple more minutes. All right. Good morning. Um, my name is Jeff Lamborn. I am the chair of Somerville's Environmental Commission. Uh, but my question comes to you uh, in a professional capacity. Uh, I work as an environmental remediation engineer um, in the New York State uh, DEC, Environmental Conservation. Uh, we are now required to perform an environmental footprint analysis on any remediation project. Yeah. Um, they given us they've given us many tools and, and I apologize if you went through this in your presentation I didn't uh, stay I wasn't here for all of it. Um, one of the tools they gave us is a US EPA tool uh, spreadsheets for environmental uh, environmental footprint analysis. Could you comment on how if you have experience with that how it has worked for for the EPA and what do you recommend as in our professional capacity how to utilize it. The tool is called in environmental footprint. Yeah, uh, S, it's SAFE is the acronym, uh, Spreadsheet for Environmental Footprint Analysis. Actually, that's not a SAFE, um, but uh, but uh, it's the, the acronym is is rel related to that. There's some other tools that they recommend as well, but um, are you familiar with it and, and do you have any experience with it? I do not have any experience with this SAFE tool. I feel like you guys are stumping me this morning. I see how much more I have to learn for, about, what, about what we do within our walls at EPA. I'm not familiar with that tool. Um, but if Michael, write that down, that will be another point, yet another point of follow up for me. And okay. um, I'll make sure we connect you with someone okay. who's thank on our you. team. Okay? Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jeff Lamborn. Thank you. Part of why I'm, we're so busy at ANJAC is because EC members keep giving us homework too. So it's not just you. <laughs> Let's go to this side. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Totora from the Pittman Environmental Commission. Um, so my question is about water quality. Um, we recently have been having an increase in turbidity because of um, construction work, large scale construction work that's happening upstream of us. So what can we do um, when it's something that's happening upstream and affecting us in our community? Um, and you know, it's kind of falling on deaf ears. Yeah, so you, you're noticing this, is this like a place where, you, like, is this near your residence that you're noticing this? So it's kind of flowing down into our lake and waterway, um, but the actual construction is happening in another town upstream of us. Okay, um, I really think um, how it could help is whoever issued the permits for the project, they definitely gave them the parameters around what can be done and what should be done. And if something kind of goes awry, it really lays the framework for how it, it should be addressed. So I think it really depends on what level the project that's happening, um, where was it permitted, and to go to that respective permitting authority to start with. So that might be, you could definitely start with your local government and see. Um, it sounds like depending on a project, and the scale of it, it could be local, county, or state. When it comes to those types of projects, it's usually not the federal government who's a part of it, but certainly um, one of those levels. So I'd say start with your town and see what permits may have been filed, and they can give you some good direction from there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's go to, to this side, and then we'll go back here. We've just got a couple more minutes, so we may not get to everyone. Well, thank you for hanging on for me. Um, 
I'm John Gibbons. I'm from Lake Como, and I run a teaching garden called Candide's Garden. And um, we, we've we been promulgating that effect throughout the town in, in Lake Como and the Patchwork Wildlife. Okay, that's the background. I'm very interested in this uh, fantastic uh, sum of money that seems to be available. Mm -hmm. And um, we're a little town, we got a thousand houses. And uh, the, 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 the question is, is we're fairly new at uh, fundraising and uh, when the little forays we've had into it, we've been asking for too little money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what I was wondering is, is, is there, is there, because of the, the, the cost of administrating a grant, of course, you, you probably want to have a minimum amount. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering where that might lie in relation to some of the things we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, can I give you an example that mm -hmm. here's the, here's the thing. Okay. We, before COVID, we had our kids come down from Staten Island, North Staten Island, underserved kids mm -hmm. down to see us and, you know, and learn that uh, peppers don't grow in cellophane, you know, that type of thing. The kids had never been out of Staten Island before. Yeah. They were funded uh, by, by something, in, some firm, something in New York, okay? Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful experience. That's what we want to focus on. And so the the problem comes down to uh, renting a bus for like a thousand dollars. Now that's well, you know, and we could do five visits a year, at, and that would be under ten thousand dollars. And I can't make the connection between the money that's up there and the money we need. Do, yeah. do you have any ideas? Yes. Yes, this is a question I can answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, one of the really big funding pots that we're about to, okay, can you hear me? Is this better? This is better. Okay. Um, one of the really big funding pots that we have coming, um, they're called Environmental Justice Community Block Grants. Um, and we anticipate that this is um, a notice of funding opportunity that's going to go out late this month or early next month. And uh, in structuring this program, we have $2 billion of funds that are available. With that $2 billion of funds, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're reaching organizations of all sizes, projects of all sizes, organizations that have gotten funding from EPA for years, and brand new organizations. And I'm just going to take a moment, I'm going to zoom out for a moment and just say, with all this bipartisan infrastructure law money and all this Inflation Reduction Act money, because it's so much, the magnitude of this money. If we don't get this money into hands of organizations and communities that have never applied for these funds before, we're not gonna spend all this money. So us knowing a part of the reason, one of the ways we'll know we'll be, that we've been successful is that we're reaching new communities in new ways with projects of all scopes and sizes. So when you see uh, the block grant announcement come out, we have monies uh, that very small pots to very large pots, planning and assessment projects all the way up to implementation opportunities. We're trying to be like incredibly versatile uh, with the ways that the money could be used. So certainly look for that. Um, the other thing that will be coming really soon are these entities called Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. Uh, we call them Tic Tacs for short, like little candies in the grocery store. But I'll say the name again, Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. And what those organizations are going to do is pretty much be like the first place you can go to know what are all the funds that are available for the idea that I have in mind that I want to, to further in my particular community. And these technical assistance centers are definitely going to give support for EPA grants, but they're also going to give support for other Inflation Reduction Act programs that were funded by other federal agencies, like energy, transportation, and others. So um, you don't have to go to each federal agency to figure out what's going on. Just come to that technical assistance center, and they can give you some direction, and you'll know all the opportunities that are available right now. So. Thank you for that. We're certainly trying to be um, more um, uh, reactive to that because we've certainly heard this over the course of, of decades. And then two, with uh, past federal funds, that it takes so long to have another opportunity to apply for things if you don't get it the first time. Um, with that grant program, we're also trying to have it implemented on a rolling basis. So we're hoping that between having that rolling grant opportunity, the scales of projects and the size of the budget, um, as well as the door open with the technical assistance centers that we're definitely getting more federal resources into the hands of communities. 
Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, thank That's you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Olivia. I'm going to ask this gentleman for our last question of the morning because we do need to move into our workshop session. So yeah, my apologies, everything. but please. Neil Hendrickson, uh, Reddington Township, uh, EC. Uh, you haven't mentioned it, but I'm sure our township is not the only one facing this. So our solid waste recycling contract just recently came up. Uh, the current cost is, let's say, $700,000 for the, the three years. Uh, it's just the one bid that came in is for a million seven. So uh, other townships are going to face this because we are using one of the largest uh, solid waste recycling companies in the country. Um, and uh, so if we go to either a solid waste utility, uh, we'll have very inequitable uh, distribution of costs. Uh, and if we go to uh, a sub subscription service, we run the risk of having more vehicles. And also, it, uh, if people look at the cost, and we're not going to, the, the, the current township administration will not raise taxes. So it'll go to a subscription service. And what that is likely to do is make everybody throw everything out. And it has made REC, and in fact, most of our township, apoplectic. Um, and I can't believe I'm the only one, uh, and, and we formed a, a solid waste subcommittee that's been active for a year looking for answers. And this is where we are as the bid came in. So uh, if you have any uh, familiarity with this, I think the disincentive that's coming because of the high costs that you alluded to earlier uh, is, uh, is gonna be a great concern. And I don't know if anyone has answers but it's uh, beware of what's out there. It's a caveat. Wow. Well, that's an, yeah, that's one to end on. So let me and <laughs> at least um, create a pathway here. So uh, I don't know if Dini is still in the room or not. Oh yeah, hi Dini. Um, so if you can make a note of that. Um, I've also been in contact. I haven't heard that from other New Jersey municipalities, and I'm not even sure I understand all the macroeconomics of it, but I'm going to dig in and work on it. We, um, I've also been working a little bit with the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, and so certainly Manhattan has got some solid waste issues just because of the density of the population. Um, so let's see if we can't dig into this issue a little bit more and find some solutions. I don't have answers yet, but this is a prime example of how working together. And today you've given um, ANJAC homework, you've given EPA homework. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, environmental commissioners are really on the forefront. They get it. They're, they're making a difference and they bring the really tactile nitty grittiness of issues that need solving to us. And while I don't have an answer for you standing at this podium today, I'm going to find one for you and we're going to work on this together and figure it out. So I want to thank you for everything that you do from the bottom of my heart, from all of our staff. Um, I want to thank Olivia for taking time and spending it with us today. So thank you. It's great. It's really great to see you. Thank you. I also want to make a note um, that we have done everything we can to make this a low waste and no waste event. So we have uh, real plates and real forks and real knives for you that we've rented. And we also have the compost bins for anything that's paper or food waste. There's a label on those bins that tells you what goes into them. So we're doing our very best um, to bring a low and no waste event uh, to you and for you. And we're happy to share advice on what we've done if you have conferences coming up. So with that, um, we're going to dismiss this class and our next class starts at 1030. So we encourage you to find your way to your workshop room. Make sure to visit um, our sponsors who are here today who make this conference possible. And uh, I will see you back in this room at about 145. So have a good environmental Congress, everyone. <laughs>